Hey guys, Ms. Peterson here, and this is AP Chemistry Lecture 6-1, where we're going to be starting our unit on thermodynamics and thermochemistry. We're going to be talking about energy, heat, and enthalpy, and how all those terms are kind of the same thing, but kind of not. Um, we'll talk about phase changes and enthalpy. This corresponds to AP Chemistry Topics 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, and 6.5. In your textbook, you can find more information in Chapter 5. Okay, so... Let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna start off with just the basic vocabulary that we're gonna be using. First off, energy, okay? Energy is the ability to do work or produce heat. And this is also called the internal energy of the system. You'll sometimes see that written as delta U. For our purposes, delta U and E will be equivalent. We will be sticking mostly with E, for energy, but know that this is also called the internal energy. It's in units of joules, most often kilojoules. And we'll talk about potential energy and kinetic energy. Potential energy as a broad category is energy because of something's position, okay? In chemistry, we often talk about it in terms of the chemical bond, okay? When two atoms are bonded, they have a lower potential energy, okay? Now, when those two atoms are infinitely far apart, okay, as that intermolecular distance goes to infinity, that potential energy approaches zero. But note, it is at a lower state when bonding, okay? So when the bond forms, energy is released, and when the bond breaks, energy must be absorbed, okay? Now, this is also related to kinetic energy. This is the energy of motion. Uh, specifically, we're gonna be talking about the rotational and vibrational and translational, which is like the movement, motion of our particles, okay? Now, this is proportional to temperature in Kelvin, okay? Kinetic energy is directly proportional to temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. And just as a reminder, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Also, this equation, uh, which you might have remembered from even middle school, is helpful to remember because it helps us remember that a joule equals, like one joule, is one kilogram meter squared per second squared. So if you ever forget the units, joules, and what they're equivalent to when, you know, doing some unit analysis, if you remember this, mass is kilograms, velocity is meters per second, and then we have that squared, that can remind you of the energy uh, of joules, okay? Now, the first law of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy. Energy can never be created nor destroyed. Any change in the energy of a system must be balanced by the transfer of energy into or out of that system, okay? And that's gonna be really important when looking at our problems. Now, heat, we use the letter Q for heat. What this is, is a transfer of energy, okay? Heat is only ever talked about in terms of the movement of that kinetic energy, which is measured by a change in temperature, okay? So if we have two systems, okay, that are different temperatures and they're in contact with each other, their particles will collide and that will transfer that kinetic energy, okay? That is the process, and it always flows from a warmer object to a cooler one, okay? Also remember, temperature is not directly a measure of heat. It just reflects the motion of the particles on average, okay? Temperature, like we said, average kinetic energy. And always just remember that heat them up, speed them up type relationship. Okay. Also, what is going to be important is when we talk about our chemical reactions, what we define as the system. Like in this picture, it is the hydrogen gas and the oxygen gas, and what we count is the surroundings. Okay, matter cannot enter or leave the system, but the energy can, either as heat or, or as work. And we'll talk a little bit more about work in a second here. Okay because that is one of the ways energy travels, okay? When kinetic energy is transferred, that energy transfer is called heat. 
This happens due to the movement of molecules, and it happens until the temperatures are the same. We call that thermal equilibrium. Now, a system can lose or gain energy in two ways, as heat or as work. So let's talk about those two things real quick. In chemistry, we will be focusing mostly on the heat side of this, but it does help to see where all these energies come from, okay? Heat is energy transferred through the kinetic energy of particles and their collisions, like in conduction. So basically what you have there is if you have a particle that has a high energy, these mean the velocity of the particles. So I'll do big V for the bigger arrow and then small v. When these two particles collide, they can transfer that energy. So that one would gain energy and this one would lose energy. Now that's on a single collision and single interaction. In something like your cup of coffee cooling, this is happening on a much bigger scale. Tons of particles are colliding, tons of energies being transferred in these teeny tiny collisions. And that overall results in your coffee cooling and the mug or the air around it warming up. They are both measured in joules, okay? Now for heat, positive Q means that heat is absorbed and negative Q means heat is released. The equation that we will most often associate with heat is that the heat equals mc delta t. And we'll be talking about that a lot more in a second. Now, work is slightly different. In physics, work is a force acting over a distance. You might remember that equation from physics class. But in chemistry, we express this as negative P delta V, okay? Or a change in volume of the system, okay? Um, and this is at constant pressure, and then we have the change in volume. Now, when we have positive work, okay, that means the work is done on a system. The volume decreases, which makes sense, okay? We have V final minus V initial. If the volume decreases, the final will be smaller, so that will end up being a negative number. Negative of a negative number is a positive. Where negative work it means work is done by the system. The system loses energy because it uses it to expand for that volume to increase. And just for my physics people, just a quick little proof showing how those two things are equivalent. Okay, if we have force times distance, okay? Pressure is defined as force over area. So then force would be pressure times area, okay? So if I put that in for the force, pressure times that cross-sectional area, we can think of the distance as that delta H, the thing, the amount that it moved. So that distance would be delta H, and then if we have that cross-sectional area A times the height, okay, area times height gives you the change in volume, okay? So that's how those two equations work out. Okay, so does everything heat up the same? No, okay, I want you to think about a certain question. Why? When it snows, why does the ice stick on like the soil and that kind of ground, but it melts on the black asphalt, like on the road? Why does it melt faster on the road than it does on the asphalt, even if it's not an iced road, okay? And the answer is something called specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity, the letter C, is the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram by one degree. And this is one of our key equations for this unit. It is that, nope, I wanna use a different color for that. It is that Q equals MC delta T, where Q is heat energy in joules, M is your mass in kilograms, C is your specific heat capacity, that's what's over here, okay? And that's normally in joules per gram degree Celsius, though sometimes you will see it in moles, 
okay? And that's called the molar heat capacity. And delta T is your change in temperature, okay? Which is typically in degrees Celsius, but note it can be in Kelvin. One of the things that's kind of cool about this is because we're talking about a change in temperature and Celsius to Kelvin is just, um, is not multiplied by a factor. It's just adding on that 298.1, two, sorry, 237, 273, 273. I can math. I know these things. 273.15. The change in temperature in Celsius equals the change in temperature in Kelvin. So we don't have to be too concerned about those conversions. Okay. Now, if something has a high specific heat capacity, that means it takes a lot of energy to change temperature. Okay. Where if something has a low specific heat capacity, it changes temperature easier. Okay. Or it takes a little bit of energy to change its temperature. Now, how does that apply to, say, the beach, okay? At the beach, why is the sand so hot but the water still cold, even though the sun's been shining on it all day? Okay, two different kind of answers there. But some of it, of course, has to do with the specific heat capacity. Water, as you guys see right here, has a really high specific heat capacity. Okay, 4.18 is considered a high specific heat capacity. Water can absorb a lot of energy without changing its temperature. That's why we maybe put our chicken in water when we want it to thaw faster. Because the water, for all of the energy that gets released by whatever's in the water, the water doesn't change the temperature that much. Okay, now I do want you guys to just look at this table for a second. We have the phases of things represented. We have their specific heat capacities. What kind of patterns do you notice? Well, something you might notice is that the gases, okay, kind of tend to be lower than the, um, sorry, the solids, that's what I meant to say, the solids tend to be lower than similar compounds in their gas phase, okay? And metals, okay, I'm going to look at the metals in general. Metals tend to have low specific heat capacities, which makes sense. We don't want our pan to absorb the heat energy. We want it to quickly change its temperature so that it can heat up our food, okay? So they have relatively low specific heat capacities. Where gases tend to have higher specific heat capacities, but um, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Now, this is also a table that's an appendix in your book. I've also put it on our reference tables. So specific capacities for a substance is something that you can just look up. Okay. And basically what it means is like, say I have one gram of water, it will take one, um, its specific heat capacity is 4.18. So it would take that many joules to raise its temperature by one degree. And fun fact, this is actually what a calorie is. Not a food calorie. Food calories are actually kilocalories, but a calorie with a lowercase c is 4.18 joules. Okay. What, how do we actually solve this out and do that, though? Let's look at an example problem. We have a 21.3 gram sample of a metal is heated to 70 degrees Celsius and dropped into a 62.4 grams of water at 21 degrees Celsius. The final temperature of the water is 24 degrees Celsius. That's assuming once it reaches thermal equilibrium. Calculate the specific heat of the metal. Okay, so first let's just kind of picture what's going on here. I'm going to go ahead and draw a picture. Okay, so we have our water. Okay, and then we have a metal block being dropped into it, okay? The mass of the metal is 21.3 grams. Its initial temperature 
is 70.0 degrees Celsius. And then we also have the mass of our water, which is 62.4 grams at an initial temperature of 21.0 degrees Celsius. And then the final temperature of the water and thus of the metal, okay, we're saying once it like reaches thermal equilibrium, is 24.0 degrees Celsius. Okay, the water got hotter and the metal got colder. But note, it didn't do that by the same amount because they don't have the same specific heat capacities. As that heat transfers, it's gonna cause differences in their energy. As the heat, or Q, transfers out of the metal, okay? Now, what do we know about this heat? Well, if we take this as an insulated system, okay, then nay, the heat lost by the metal is going to equal the heat gained by the water, okay? And we are also going to need the specific heat capacity of water, which is 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius, okay? For C, water. So now we are going to use this equation with our specific heat capacity equation to find the specific heat capacity of the metal, okay? So we have negative mass of the metal times C delta T, this is for the metal, equals MC delta T for the water. So let's go ahead and plug in our values. Negative, the mass of the metal, 21.3 grams, or yeah, let's plug it in here, times C, I'm gonna use M for metal, times its change in temperature, which will be 20 final, minus initial, always final minus initial, equals the mass of the water and times the specific heat capacity of the water times the change in temperature of the water. Okay, so, and then we just algebra. So, the specific heat capacity of the metal will be equal to, I need a calculator, got my calculator. So I have 62.4 times 4.18 times 24 minus 21. And that gives me 782.5. And note the grams that cancel out and the degrees Celsius cancel out. I'm left with joules. Divided by um, 21.3 times 24.0 minus 70.0. Okay, that gives us... 979.8 grams degrees Celsius, because we have degrees Celsius there. And then we plug that into our calculator. And we get a specific heat capacity of 0 0.799 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Okay, so it's just figuring out, okay, this calculation right here lets us figure out the heat absorbed by the water, and that's going to equal this, which is the heat lost by the metal. Okay, okay, cool, okay, cool. So now let's talk about enthalpy, okay? Enthalpy is the flow of energy at constant pressure when two systems are intact, okay? Enthalpy is kind of just a fancy word for heat. At constant pressure, the change in enthalpy equals the heat gained or lost, okay? So for almost all, for all of our problems, delta H equals Q, okay? We'll be talking about a lot of different enthalpies. For example, the enthalpy of a reaction, delta H reaction, 
That's the amount of heat released or absorbed by a chemical reaction, typically given in units, kilojoules per mole of reaction. Now, enthalpy of fusion is melting, okay, or freezing, also in um, kilojoules per mole, okay? And delta H of vaporization is vaporize or boil, okay, to break up all those intermolecular forces, okay? And that happens at the boiling point. Now, often what you'll see is delta H naught, not okay and what that means is that this was done at standard conditions now this is not to be confused with stp okay stp is zero degrees celsius now i don't know about you but i'm not very comfortable at zero degrees celsius rather this is like standard lab conditions which is 25 degrees celsius or 298.15 Kelvin. 289, 298. I think it's 298. It's the plus 273, 25 plus 273. Yeah, 298. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Now, delta H is positive when heat enters a system and negative when heat is lost in the system, okay? Now, just a reminder, don't forget this. When bonds are formed, energy is released, okay? It is exothermic. When bonds are broken, this is requires the absorption of energy, okay? This is an endothermic process. Okay, cool? Okay, cool. Now, one of the ways that you guys will determine this is from those reaction energy profiles where the difference between the reactants and the products is your delta H. So is this reaction endothermic or exothermic? Well, the products have less energy than the reactants. So that means that this is an exothermic process. So then delta H in this reaction is 20 minus 40, negative 20 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Now note, some places you, you will see this just in kilojoules, but the Standard convention right now is kilojoules per moles of reaction. So just know if you're looking at your textbook or any older uh, AP chemistry materials, you might just see it in kilojoules per mole, but it should be kilojoules per mole of reaction, okay? Which just means, hey, if one mole of this reacts, what's that enthalpy, okay? Okay, so last thing we're gonna talk about is energy, temperature, and phase changes, okay? Now, phase changes do not have to do with, um, with breaking or forming chemical bonds. So, when does the enthalpy increase? Okay, it has any time that those intermolecular, those IMFs are broken, okay, that involves an input in energy, okay, which will be a positive change in enthalpy. Okay, where if they release energy, that's a negative delta H. Okay, phase changes that involve putting in energy, enthalpy increases as you go up. So that's solid to liquid, aka melting, which sometimes you'll see as the heat of fusion. Okay, fusion technically is freezing. I, in this graphic, to me it's in the wrong spot, but it still has to do with that solid liquid phase change where liquid to gas is vaporization. That one you will see. And then of course, if you go from solid straight to gas, that's sublimation. That also has a positive delta H. You have to put energy in, in order for that to happen. Where when things release energy, okay, that's if you go from a gas to a liquid, condensation. 
This is what happens and forms dew drops on your grass in the morning, okay? Liquid to, um, nope, not liquid to gas, liquid to solid, okay, AKA freezing. That's what happens in your freezer as your ice, as your water turns into ice cubes, okay? Even that is, though that happens at a cold temperature, it is an exothermic process because energy is being removed. And then, of course, anytime you go from a gas all the way down to a solid. That's called deposition. This is how that sheet of ice forms on your windshield or your windows on a cold morning. Okay? Now, this right here is called a heating curve. And this is taking water, okay, and putting in energy at a constant rate. So putting in energy, okay? And you can see in the time that energy is going to be doing different things, okay? For the first couple minutes here, you are heating the ice, okay? And then you are melting. Note, during phase changes, The temperature is constant, okay? When you, a phase change is happening, the energy isn't going in to making the molecules move faster, but rather breaking apart those intermolecular attractions, okay? And then you can heat the liquid water and vaporize water. And at each of these stages, say we wanna calculate how much energy is being absorbed, okay? Well, when you're heating something, you can just use that Q equals MC delta T, okay? But note, on a phase change, there is no change in temperature, but we know heat is still being used. We would have to use the, the delta H of the um, fusion, okay? We'd use the delta of H of fusion times, if it's in kilojoules per mole, times the moles or N to find that. Then if you're heating the liquid water, that temperature is gonna be increasing. So we can use Q equals MC delta T to find that. For the vaporizing, again, temperature is not changing. So we would have to use the delta H of vaporization times the number of moles to get the Q, okay? And then heating steam, Q again would be MC delta T. Now, something else to note when you guys are looking at something like this, is that specific heat capacity C depends on the phase. Okay, it matters whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas. Ice's specific heat capacity is not the same as water's. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a problem like this. We have a piece of ice in a freezer, okay? And the mass of our ice is going to be 1.53 grams. It's initially at a temperature, okay? So our initial temperature, Ti, is going to be negative 15.1 degrees Celsius. The ice is removed from the freezer and melts completely, melts completely after reaching a temperature of 0.0. .0. If the specific heat of ice, okay, so C ice, is 2.03 joules per gram degree Celsius, note ice has a lower specific heat capacity than water. Why do you think that is? Why does ice change temperature easier than water does? Okay, um, and then it also tells us that the molar heat of fusion is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so how much heat is required for that entire process to occur? Also, just to answer my question, um, ice has a lower specific heat capacity because it's a solid, okay? So it's easier to get those molecules to bump into each other and transfer that thermal energy. So it raises temperature a lot more. Water actually has such a high specific heat capacity because of all the way it bends rather than like has translational motion um, and kinetic energy. It like vibrates like this and like the bonds that shrink 
um, if you're picturing like oxygen here and the two hydrogens, those bonds can shrink and it can wiggle and it can absorb energy in a lot of different ways that doesn't always increase its kinetic energy. Okay, so it says how much heat is required for the entire process to occur. And now we actually have two separate processes going on here. Okay, we have, um, so Q total, the total energy is going to be the Q to heat the ice plus the Q to melt the ice. These are two separate processes. Okay, with two separate equations. It's basically like we're going, if you're looking up here, this phase and then all the way over to point C. Okay, so when we use those equations, we are going to have the Q to heat the ice. We can find that by just using MC delta T because we know its temperature will be changing. And then the Q to melt the ice, we would have to find by the delta H of fusion times the number of moles of the um, ice. Okay, so let's go ahead and start plugging in some of our numbers so that you guys can see this. We have our mass of ice, 1.53 grams, times the specific heat capacity of ice, not water, 2.03 joules per gram degree Celsius, and the change in temperature of the water. That's going to be zero minus negative 15.1, so that'll just be 15.1 degrees Celsius, okay? Plus the heat of fusion, which is six, 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Now, pause. Do you guys notice something that might be an issue later here? We have joules here and then kilojoules here. So we're going to actually need to do some conversion, okay? I'm going to actually show you guys this kind of using dimensional analysis. So we have 60.01 kilojoules per mole. Let's convert the kilojoules. So one kilojoule is 1,000 joules. And then we do need to find how many moles we have. We know we have 1.53 grams. And then to convert it to moles, we would have to um, convert uh, from grams to moles. What's the molar mass of H2O? That is one you should just have memorized. It is 18.02 grams per one mole. Okay, so a lot of math there, but really I'm just converting the kilojoules and converting to moles. And then you guys can kind of see how those units would work out and I'd be left with joules on both of these, okay? So let's go ahead and plug it into our calculator. We have 1.53 times 2.03 times 15.1. So the energy required to heat that ice is 46.899, so I'm just gonna say 46.9 joules, plus the energy required to melt the ice, 6.01, times 1,000 times 1.53 divided by 18.02, which gives us 510.3 joules, okay? So it took a lot more energy to melt the ice than it did to heat the ice, okay? And that makes sense, okay? The ice is gonna start melting a lot faster than it's gonna finish melting if you have an ice cube sitting on your counter. So then our total energy for the whole process would be 556, oh, 557.2 joules. Okay, and for sig figs, we have three digits in all of our answers. I would just say 557 joules. And that's heat. Okay, cool. Okay, cool.